Welcome back. This is part two of the Ultima Pro XL build where I build, modify and race a vintage Kyosho Ultima at the Castle Hill 5 hour vintage endurance meeting. And looking at the rear of this chassis here, I've taken a file and removed a bit of the material in that location and this part. I've also had to pre-drill and countersink a hole in the rear of the chassis to accommodate the Triumph rear motor guard. And it's interesting to note that there are many parts on this car that are specific only to this model and don't carry over from other Ultima cars and trucks. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring the specific components to work out how much rear toe we have and we have two millimeters of toe on the rear. And back to the rear of this car here, what I'm doing is illustrating where the suspension arm folds down and connects with the chassis there. And the reason for removing that material is to allow the arm to fold down lower to create more droop for the rear end. Now onto the carbon fiber rear shock tower that Paul at Berserk was helpful to uh, help me make this to carry the plastic wing mounts on the rear shock tower plus it's also a 3.5 millimeter thick shock tower also running sway bars on the car I didn't do that back in the day but on this occasion I wanted to give them a shot and see how the car performed with them in place that's the rear shock tower that I made for the car all those years ago to mount the associated Viper body shell and I'm just double checking the fitment of that custom top plate. The rear hubs on this car are also the same as the uh, Laser ZX and ZXR cars, also the Triumph. And on the rear of this car I'm bolting up a retrofit kit to allow the use of the Kyosho belt driven transmission which requires this rectangular plate that spaces the transmission up off the chassis plate and I'm using some double sided tape here to seal up the transmission to keep out any dust and debris from the belt drive components on the inside of that transmission. As you can see the profile of the transmission fits in nicely and now this is where the build actually does begin so on goes this rear component and I've put some more double sided tape to cover in that hole and now I'm going to press the transmission down on some screws that locate the transmission and now I'm engaging that tape into the plate and I'm going to screw it all together and seal it up nicely. And on go the wide track rear suspension arms and sliding the rear bulkhead components into place which is a really nice neat fit so there's no forcing and just two screws running up through the underside of the chassis to hold the bulkhead and one last screw to tie the transmission and the rear bulkhead assembly together. Now onto the front suspension we've got the specific wide XL front suspension arms there and I've had a custom carbon fibre front shock tower that is three millimetres taller and the reason for that will be later mentioned in the video. Now fitting the wide front suspension arms to the centre bulkhead, making sure to put the Eclipse in place and onto the front spindles and something also to note here is the front C hubs of the Pro XL seem to be specific just to this car which have two holes in them which allow the adjustment of track width but also it seems the height of the C, hub, C hub on the arm and in this case I'm going to go with the widest setting and checking the movement of the suspension now and everything's nice and free which is something that needs to be considered when working on these old cars that have been used and some of them have been abused Cuts, parts could be uh, bent or broken or worn out so you just want to check movement works nice and easily and now onto the front sway bar and again even when winding the screws down and holding that sway bar you want to make sure it's still free and able to move and of course 
anywhere I'm using a machine screw into a metal object I'm using thread lock because nobody wants screws coming loose while out in the racetrack and now fitting the aluminium steering posts for the bell cranks which again you got to make sure you use some thread locking fluid on them and now we're going to look at the original bell cranks which are not very good in my opinion and they tend to bind and I know that they're weak and they break so we're replacing those with the laser ZX6 bore raced components and it's interesting to note that these are very much similar to the original blue ones that were on the ZXRR, the ZXS and cars of that era so they're still a 90s design super free and something else I really like about them is there is a spline on this side of the components and they allow you to run it at 180 degrees or at 90 degrees depending on the application application you have need for uh, just a tip for anyone out there I take an M3 tap sometimes and I like to clear out threads of old thread lock or even into some plastic components where you need uh, a machine screw to go into. Now on to the screws that hold this bearing into place on the front or on the plate here which is from a laser ZXR and I've got a washer going down between those two components also making sure it's nice and free and in this regard I've had a bit of a play around with the orientation of that drag link and this is not how it should be so <laughs> I've left it as an example and we're going to show you why later on in the video now getting the front suspension bolted up to the chassis on goes the bumper and we're going to look at something that really was a bit of a pet peeve for me with this car and which is all of that flex yeah not good um, I wanted to rectify this situation so I worked with Paul at Berserk who helped me come up with a solution which was this top plate I sent him down some of the original components uh, some drawings and some measurements and it all worked out really good so bolting it all together now it's taken away all that flex and of course is it going to be a performance and handy um, advantage I don't really think so I just think it's going to make it more reliable and when you look at the tracks we used to race on back in the early 90s compared to the tracks of today the cars are getting more of a workout and I'm just hoping to keep it more reliable and on goes the top of the shock hardware onto the top of those shock towers I just like getting this out of the way as, as soon as I can in the build onto the rear drive shafts and these unis are far better than the dog bones I'm running Lunsford titanium turnbuckles and also a side note I had Paul machine three millimeter holes in those shock towers for the camber links the 2.6 millimeter screws in my opinion would just bend or possibly shear on hard impacts now onto these alloy hex hubs they are machined in such a way so that the taper fitment only works on one side so I'm showing the orientation of what what side faces the bearing and that's that molded side faces the bearing there just checking the uh, movement of the rear which is all good now onto the front camber link and anywhere a M3 screw goes through the chassis I put a lock nut on the other side of it keeps it reliable because we don't want screws coming loose out there on the racetrack and this car will be tested very thoroughly and back to the front C hubs I end up pulling that pivot pin out and we're going with the standard width track not the wide track because that's what the manual recommended so I'm just fixing that right now And don't you love these Lunsford adjustment tools? So much simpler. And this is where I find out I had the orientation of that plate wrong. It just won't fit through the front end there. So off it comes, swap it over, and now 
it's working beautifully. Very happy with that assembly and it's just such an improvement on the original setup. Again, winding a lock nut down onto those threads that on, on the other side of that plate. And here we are looking at the transmission and this is the Triumph 102 spur gear which is too big for the application that I have. So I've jerry-rigged something here which is a 87 tooth modern day spur gear and this is about the best I could do to fit something smaller on there which is just being locked up. I'm not actually running it as a slipper because the silver can doesn't require any slip in my opinion. On goes the links to the rear sway bar assembly and very happy at this point. Everything's going together really nicely. I also put 0.4 millimeters of shims on each side of those front axles to stop the wheels rubbing against the hubs. In testing I found the shocks were under dampened so we're going to pull them apart here and change the valving and I also found the front coils were unmatched so out goes the piston being careful not to damage the o-rings and I'm pulling out the two hole piston and going with a single hole being very careful to put it back in there not to damage the o-rings again checking the activation also checking the length of those shocks so I'm running much more oil and 35 weights going in the front much better on go the new matching pair of coils and it's interesting to note these are well used shocks and they still present so nicely and in the video they look fantastic Okay, so the length of the shock tower is about 3mm taller and what I was finding before was the shock were bottoming out before full travel was met in the suspension arm. So now I've got a bit more adjustability and I'm really happy with the outcome. The rear shocks were the same, under dampened, so again very carefully removing that the rods and swapping the valves over for single hull putting the Eclipse back on and carefully reinserting that shaft into the shock body. Double checking the length to make sure they're the same and running 30 weight oil on the rear. Maybe it'll be over dampened in the rear, I don't know, but we'll have a look at it. We'll get it out of the track, we'll see what it does. Very happy with the shocks, they look great, they work great. And in with some more stainless hardware. Now bolting up to the rear shock tower. And I like to do the tops first because I want to check that they're not being over tightened. So I like to lift, have a bit of a play with them, make sure they're not too tight and now being screwed to the bottom okay and now we're rolling the car on its wheels I've got the body fitted, I've got the wing fitted and wanted to show this section here which uh, illustrates the rear part of the body which has been bolted to the rear shock tower via those plastic mounts and I've cut the body to allow easier access and I'm running 2.2 inch JC racing wheels, thanks to John at JC, he's been helping all us guys out with these fantastic wheels, all sorts of designs and colours to fit all different manufacturers. He's doing great things over there. And here's the control motor we use for these events, which is a Johnson 540J, which has been cleaned out and I just thought I'd illustrate um, a little bit of machine oil going into those bushes so they don't run bearings. And I just like to have a bit of a spin Make sure that oil sort of works its way in there and get it ready to bolt into the car. And I really like using these three millimeter taper washers and coupled, coupled with a um, stainless screw. They prevent any sort of wear marks or gouging into the, <clears throat> into the uh, 
motor plate there. And what I'm running is a, seems to be like a rubberized disc that sandwiches between this metal heat sink and the motor plate. And is said to stop or help prevent movement of the motor moving against that motor plate. So it's something I've been using for quite a while um, on a few of my cars and it's worked out really good. Now we're going to fasten the motor to the motor plate. Pretty obvious stuff to the average racer I'm sure but to people who are new to the hobby or don't have a lot of experience I just thought I'd illustrate and show how this system works and it's just far better than putting a standard screw against that motor plate and this is why and I also find it tightens up really nicely and is again a good method to stop it from moving onto the pinion now and this is one this is one piece of thread that absolutely must have thread lock on it. It's easily the first thing that seems to come undone if it doesn't have thread lock on that on that grub screw there. And so what we're looking for is the flat on the shaft because that's where the grub screw in the pinion is going to tighten down onto. Again, all the racers will know this sort of stuff, but this is just for people who have never done it before or don't have a lot of experience. We're getting the mesh up and just double checking the mesh there. I like to do it in, in um, a few stages, but what I'm doing now is I'm setting the two gears and aligning them. And as an exaggeration here, I've brought a small ruler in just to double check that those are the two faces that you want to be even. There's no point hanging a pinion gear off the side of a spurgy, you want to engage as much of the teeth as you can and of course you want the mesh to be a, have a little bit of movement there too, too tight is no good and too loose is just going to end up stripping gears so now winding the, the uh, screw up into the rear motor, motor guard and bolting it to the top of that aluminium box section it's going to help protect that motor in shunts at the rear or crashes and things. And I've put some little stickers on these components here which remind me of what weight shock oil I'm running in these shock absorbers. And here's the car pretty much ready to go. So I've fitted all the electronics now. I'm running a Tekin FX Pro ESC there. Spectrum receiver, a KO servo. 60,000 milliamp hour battery and the A and B transponders all good to go. So I'm going to switch on my trusty Kyo, um, KO Propo Helios radio system. Going to switch on the electronics in the car. Servo's nice and fast and strong. And I end up changing the orientation of the steering there because I couldn't get the servo to work otherwise. The servo horn was too high and was hitting the top plate, so had to run it through the center like that in the end. And you're probably wondering, what is that clear plastic shield going around the electronics? Well, there's a good chance we might be met with some rain or some mud uh, come race day, so there's not a lot of protection in this car, so I've created a bit of a shield around those components that hopefully will stop any water or mud getting into them and, and stopping the car from working so anyway there's the suspension action probably a bit over dampened but we'll find out on the day I can always change the oil yeah so I think it's done a pretty reasonable sort of job of offering some sort of protection from the elements I've never done this before but I thought well you just never know you've seen the photo in the beginning of the uh, video of the car covered in mud so it has been raced in mud before so the idea is to keep it going so anyway we're winding up to the end of the video now that's the body going back on the car I'm very happy with the build and I'm really glad to have been able to share it with the viewers and yeah I did cut 
those windows out of that body many, many years ago, so I needed some level of protection for those electronics there. So you're very happy with the build, it's worked out really good. Um, please uh, comment or leave suggestions if you like along the way. And off with the uh, electronics. And that's it for the radio. And that's the end of the video. So thank you for watching. Uh, special thanks go out to Paul at Berserk for the carbon fibre work. Also John at JC Racing who do these fantastic wheels. So if you enjoy my videos, please leave us a like and subscribe for more.